Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 750. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's August 6th, 2022. Three, two, one. <laughs> yes, it is. August 6th. <laughs> All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. As you can tell, we don't know what day it is. We've been just sitting through Lambeth press conferences and, and speeches and communiques and uh, just the chaos that is Lambeth. Now, Lambeth, I, in logistical terms, since Lambeth won many decades, centuries ago, eons ago, millennia ago, was no doubt chaos. They were putting people on sailboats. They were putting people on little carriages and trying to get them from uh, around the world into uh, Kent. London. Uh, London. London. It was London. It was London back then. La La Lambeth Palace. That's yep. why they called it the Lambeth Conference. And so back then, you know, it was chaos. So do not expect it to be any less chaotic in 2022. And it wasn't. And it isn't. And it's not done yet. But there's a lot to talk about. So we have two topics today. Lambeth and Indian corruption. Because you showed up here to, uh, 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 to to listen to us talk about Lambeth, we'll start with that. But first, George, are you tired? Are you exhausted? You, it takes a lot of effort to be a full-time priest, full-time husband, and a full-time reporter covering Lambeth. How are you doing? I'm feeling great. Uh, the amphetamines are working, Kevin. Thank you very <laughs> you know, much. That's part of the PayPal we got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm. I'm. Uh, I uh, really am feeling. I have a high degree of comp confidence and optimism mm -hmm. about now because my world has been focused on the Lambeth Conference uh, this week, uh, and also the church life. I mean, I'm really every moment's been taken up. But I really have a good sense of spiritual ease about what has been happening over this past week. Not saying it's perfect by any means. No, 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 no. In fact, I, I hearken back to a conversation I had with Archbishop Arambi uh, of Uganda probably about 12 or 13 years ago, where he said there's no salvation through Canterbury. Yes. What does that yes. mean? What? No. It, back then, it was Ron Wims. He's got to guide the church and 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 have a solution for us and and be able to to straighten out this mess we're in. And Archbishop Arambi said, like, "Kevin, he didn't say this, but you could see it is. But you're so naive. You know, this is about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. This is about." Um, uh, and he didn't use the restart. I think he used the word reboot with me. You know, we have to reboot the communion uh, to, to get this uh, back on track. And um, it's going to be a long generations process. And, and, you know, young little Kevin at the time uh, uh, was eager to make sure that uh, when there was a Lambeth and we were coming up on uh, the 2008 Lambeth, that Rowan Williams would step forward and say, listen, I hear the call of the majority of the church. I read the uh, uh, unambiguous scriptures that say that uh, marriage is a man and a woman uh, uh, a covenant, and we're going to go forth, and we're going to reset and redo and make sure that Lambeth 110 is the uh, acknowledged past and future of the communion. That didn't happen. Rowan didn't go there. And you know what? George, Justin didn't go there either. So let's have to people, you know, what's happened this this Lambeth. Help me out. Well, let's take it from our last show, mm -hmm. uh, which was Tuesday of uh, this week. Right. Because uh, so much has happened that if I start from the beginning, we'll just get bogged down. Tuesday's big news as it ended was Ro uh, Justin Welby's speech uh, in the Human Dignity plenary where they didn't talk about uh they didn't want to have an up and down vote mm -hmm. the global south had requested five minutes to address 110 justin welby refused the global south then went outside the communion's uh, agenda and had and it, it directly asked the bishops to endorse it through uh, email 
uh, basically with a picture of their voter I of their Lambeth ID, so we know that this is who we get. Not a lot of spam or anything. Right. And so on Tuesday night, the lines were drawn. Wednesday, the bishops all went up to London for the Lambeth for the London Day. The, the tree day, the, the tree day. They, yeah. they planted a tree at Lambeth Palace. Mm -hmm. They had a luncheon. A letter was read from Queen Elizabeth, and the focus was on the environment. And so it was a non-controversial day. It was an exciting day. See, three quarters, at More the least, that. yeah, had not, at least. Had not yeah. been to Lambeth before. Mm -hmm. uh, had been to a conference before. And so it's very, uh, for them, this is all new and exciting. And uh, if they're not English, if you will, seeing London, seeing Lambeth Palace from the inside uh, is a uh, really wonderful it's experience. Beautiful. It's an amazing uh, place to go. And you should be excited to go there. And yes, it's pomp and circumstance. Thank God. This is part of what we go to Lambeth for. It's not just the, the teachings. It's not just talking about the future of the communion. It's experiencing part of our past. We're in, an ancient church, and Lambeth shows that, and Canterbury shows that. It's beautiful, George. So, But during the day, that gave the uh, m many people, many bishops, an opportunity to reflect on what had happened. So we had a number of... Uh, statements released by the Scots bishops, the Welsh bishops, Michael Curry, uh, saying that this is wonderful because Justin Welby has recognized that our two legitimate views on human sexuality, mm -hmm. we are no longer uh, considered uh, to be outside the boundaries of the communion. Or second class. Or second class. Mm -hmm. So, and then a uh, statement was released, uh, signed by about a hundred odd bishops, over half of whom were from the Episcopal Church, all seven Scottish bishops, the Welsh bishops, the usual suspects, uh, pledging their support to gay and lesbian rights, 18 out of 31 Canadian bishops. So, as we expected, you know, the left took this and it interpreted it as a victory. Then we had sort of a centrist view. And I think you could say Jill Duff, who is a suffragan bishop and this area Church bishop yeah. in the Church of England, mm -hmm. she's probably the sole conservative English female bishop. She wrote a piece which was published in uh, Premier Christian News, I believe, where she said, you know, it felt like a movement of the Holy Spirit because the, the tension dissipated, it evaporated, and God is moving through the Lambeth Conference, and I had wonderful conversations with people with whom I disagree on the issues of faith and morals. And Susan Bell, the Bishop of Niagara in Canada, who's very liberal, uh, said, you know, said uh, today in a press conference that she was very concerned and frightened what would happen if the majority vote reaffirmed Lambeth 110 in an up or down vote because what would she do to her diocese which she said was very much involved in LGBTQ RSD U V W X Y Z right uh, she actually named uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> plus the plus the plus yes plus plus so <laughs> and now we just it's wonderful mm -hmm. now because these are Western bishops, they've taken to Twitter, they've taken to Facebook, and they've voiced their concerns. And so for a casual observer, you may think, oh, this is a blowout victory for the left. Well, the conservatives, I think uh, for the non-English speaking Global South bishops, and that would mean all of them, uh, mm -hmm. really, where English is not their first language, uh, I think was best summarized by the view of Bishop, I'll read his full name, <laughs> Zechariah Mayok Biar Mangar. We will He's, refer to him from this point on as Bishop Zechariah. <laughs> Bishop Zechariah. Kevin, you in, you interviewed him a few sure, years ago, yeah, didn't absolutely, you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, out in uh, California. He, he, uh, a great interview, solid person. He was one of the uh, boys, uh, what's it called? Um, Lost Boy. Lost Boys. Oh my gosh. It's too early in the morning, George. He was one of the Lost Boys. And uh, um, solid. 
not as solid as they come godly solid just amazing man so he said today that when just Archbishop Welby gave his speech we were confused because he gave a little to the left he gave a little to the right and we didn't know whether we should be angry or happy and here it is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday four days later we still don't know that we're basically confused by what he's saying because we, his words are not in line with our understanding of how the Episcopacy works. Mm -hmm. So let me just give you sort of a little day by day, a chronology, and sort of helps you understand where we're going, where we had the, the Tuesday, the, the Wednesday day of, in London and with reflections, Thursday we moved back into the business of the church and we had plenaries on interfaith and uh, ecumenical relations between Christians and non-Christians and among Christian groups. Now remember everybody is still percolating what's wrong, uh, Justin Welby told us. Well a representative of Cardinal Koch, the head of the uh, dicastery on uh, interfaith ecumenical relations yeah. from the Vatican gave a very nuanced speech. Now in 2008, well, Kevin and you and I were there, we heard Cardinal Walter Casper and Cardinal Ivan Diaz yeah. give a sermon, give two speeches that were harshly critical of the Anglican Church. In fact, Cardinal Diaz said the Anglican Communion is suffering from spiritual Alzheimer's and ecclesial Parkinson's disease. <laughs> And he we, nailed it, yes. <laughs> yes. And Cardinal Koch's speech today, for those who have ears they could hear and, and, and sort of parse Vatican language, mm -hmm. he was saying the same thing, that the Catholic Church had essentially given up on the original purpose of Anglican Catholic dialogue, which was the reunification of the Church, that we all may be one. That's not going to happen. Uh, not, we have different understandings now, not just of the, pape, the supremacy of the Pope and what happens at the Eucharist, but we have a different understanding of Christian morals. Yeah, well, absolutely. Pope Francis wrote, uh, and so did uh, the Pope before him, on human sexuality. I forget the Latin words for John, it. But. Uh, you, you mean Benedict wrote on you? Yeah, Benedict. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Remember and and John Paul John Paul did. Mm -hmm. Now, Cardinal Cook's speech, because maybe I'm assuming because Francis's Pope was not as hard hitting, because I think half the Catholic world doesn't know what Francis thinks about these issues. Yes, but essentially, it said uh, Cardinal Diaz's words in uh, 2008 were in response to the uh, vote by the Church of England to consecrate women bishops. Mm -hmm. And there were eight or nine women bishops at Lambeth 2008. There are about 90 women bishops out of the 650 at Lambeth 2022. And so I asked at a press conference, uh, is are things now 10 times worse? <laughs> because there are 10 times more women bishops. And uh, uh, Guli Francis de Cani, who's the English Bishop of Chelmsford, she's a woman. Her father was Iranian, uh, was the actual Bishop of Iran, who yes, died in the, uh, you know, at the hands of the Mullahs, the Shah, and her mother Shah, is English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, n not the Shah, but the uh, Iranian Revolution, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and everything. That's okay, yeah. all right. um, her brother was killed and all this and that. And she's moved to England, has lived in England since then, is now Bishop of Chelmsford, which is the east side of London. Um, she said, well, you know, I don't really have a problem. I have excellent relations with the Catholic bishops in my area because it comes down to they don't cons the Catholics don't consider my male colleagues to be bishops. <laughs> and so there's really no issue <laughs> dealing with me because they don't consider me or any of the other bishops to be bishops or clergy or anything. And so we get on just fine because there's no, you know, you're half in or half out. So in practical terms, in local terms, she's saying, you know, things are getting closer and closer at the local level because churches have common moral aims. 
But on the bigger picture, things are farther and farther apart. Gregory Cameron, whom Kevin, you and I know, known him for 15, 20 years. Yeah. He's, he used to be the number two man at the Anglican Consultative Council mm-hmm. on the staff. He's now Bishop of St. Asaph's in Wales. He, he said that uh, the good thing about our relations with the Vatican is that we now neither side pulls punches. We're able to speak to each other without any uh, subterfuge uh, or uh, uh, we don't need to couch our words because we know exactly where the other's coming from. So in well, essence, absolutely. we have a better relationship, even yeah. though we're farther apart. The Roman Catholics do not consider us to be uh, brothers at all, and now we agree with them. So, <laughs> absolutely. They, they don't consider <laughs> us to be a church. They mm-hmm. call us an ecclesial community, an ecclesial body, but not a church, mm-hmm. uh, because a church has apostolic succession, which they don't concede the Anglicans have, all this and that and the other. Yeah. Well, in uh, Gregory, uh, Gregory uh, described Anglicanism as a melange of different parties and groups and factions, and a melange is a uh, word to describe a uh, sort of mixed bag. And I asked, and I responded uh, to this in the press conference by saying, uh, Bishop Gregory, I've heard Anglicanism called a blamange, not a melange. And a blamange, for those who don't know fine British cooking, is a white sticky and gelatinous pudding, uh, sort of the thing that you get at school. And I said, you know, this sort of quivering jelly of a pudding is how more Catholics describe Anglicanism to me, rather than a robust uh, stew of different beliefs. How can we possibly have ongoing talks with the Vatican when we're this mix and we're a jelly, where Justin Welby is, has no spine in his gelatinous. And he did not respond to my bait, but essentially said that the uh, the fact that we do have women bishops and the fact that we are pursuing same-sex marriage and we're doing all these things is actually giving comfort to a significant portion of the Western Catholic Church. And, and that's true. Post- that's very true. Here in North America, the Roman Catholic Church is embracing more and more every day the LGTP, I forget the acronym from there, uh, community and blessing those relationships to the point, and I've not seen it, there may be some liturgies floating around uh, that they're using to actually uh, bless and uh, uh, codify same-sex marriages here in North America. Yet you don't hear about that at the Vatican level, you don't hear that at the European level, but when I'm watching Facebook and I'm watching people, Roman Catholics I follow on Facebook, including bishops, it's happening. Now, Gregory's, he's a brilliant man. He's mm-hmm. probably one of the, uh, he's probably the smartest fellow in the ha- and all at Lambeth amongst mm-hmm. the bishops in terms of it. George Sumner of Dallas and Gregory Cam- Cameron are the two smart guys at Lambeth. That's it, yeah. And Gregory told the truth. He said things are great, things are awful. But the best news is, is that it's all out in the open. Now, why I'm stressing this is that... Uh, that's the state of Anglicanism and the Anglican Communion. Mm. What Gregory described as the sort of state of affairs with the Catholic Church, the goal of uh, corporate reunion is by the wayside, and we just want to sort of get along and be good neighbors. That's what happened with Justin Welby's speech. And Phil Ashey, in a remarkably precise essay, brought this up. Mm-hmm. We're not a communion anymore because we don't share a common theology. And Justin Welby has abdicated leadership. And what we're seeing on a higher level is the filling of that vacuum of Justin Welby's withdrawal. Well, let's talk about the quote that references his abdication. If you got that in front of you somewhere. I need to pull it up. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, basically, he's in germane sense he says what if elected it sounds like lyndon johnson in 1968 if i will not be nominated (laughs) if elected i will not serve right uh what he said is that i do not have the authority nor would i wish to use the authority if i had it 
to discipline or expel anyone from the Anglican world. Let, let's do a full I step. See my, I see myself as a source of unity. Yeah. Full stop. Lambeth Primates Gathering six, seven years ago in Canterbury. He gathered the primates. The primates as a whole and a majority said, we need to hold the Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church accountable for uh, same-sex blessings, Gene Robinson, and Gene Robinson, and tearing the fabric of the communion. Justin, would you please go forward and do this on our behalf? Hold them accountable. No uh, uh, leadership roles for three years. You, you know what happened. Justin said yes. Justin, at that point, did nothing. In fact, he invited Michael Curry to be the uh, uh, preacher at uh, Harry and Meghan's uh, uh, wedding. You know, just just to, to, to plop this in the face of the Global South. So we know by his actions and by his fruit what Justin believes his role is as the Archbishop of Canterbury. So when you heard this quote at Lambeth 2022, all you have to do is look at recent history with Justin Welby and say, yeah. Makes sense. He doesn't believe it's his role. He wouldn't do it. If it was his role, he wouldn't do it. And this is why we're stuck in this uh, menagerie of uh, minority rules in the Anglican Communion. He believes the central, his central mission is the preservation of the institution. Correct. Yeah. He does not believe his role is that of a teacher or leader or guardian and guide to the faith. Because of that, uh, Justin Welby has created a vacuum. And we see people attempting to fill that vacuum. And the first people out of the box were the left. Uh, five, uh, the Ar Michael Curry, Andy John, the Archbishop of Wales, uh, the Archbishop of the Episcopal Anglican Church of Brazil, uh, the S S Mark Strange of the Scottish Episcopal Church, and uh, Linda, Linda, Linda Nichols, the Archbishop of Canada. I wanted to say Linda Evans, but that's, no, 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 no. That, that's <laughs> dying to say. Yeah. Those five, five archbishops put out a statement and invited other bishops. Now there are 170 have signed on, mm -hmm. affirming the support, un unchecked, unfettered support for the gay and lesbian movement. So here's the left seeking to fill the void of leadership where we're going to move on this quickly and we're going to seize seize the high ground now let me pause for a second oh my goodness 170 bishops well there's 650 at this lambeth and if you add in the nigerians rwandans and ugandans who aren't here plus the people from sydney and other they're probably close to 900 bishops so not 170 out of 900 in 1998 there were 70 bishops who voted no to Lambeth 110 and there are only about 700 bishops in toto so even though they've added 100 bishops they've only added 100 bishops if you mm -hmm. will the the percentage of bishops hasn't really it's grown but it hasn't grown uh in in tandem with the world around us but if you're actually looking at the who the percentage of anglicans these bishops represent it's minuscule the seven bishops of the scottish episcopal church on average have a thousand people in their churches on a sunday all of their churches seven thousand people for seven bishops um I don't think, well, we know that's the, low. You know, the, ACN, ACN, <laughs> the ACNA alone is, what, 10, 15 times as large as oh, the yeah, Scots? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, 100, 100, 100, the Welsh. Uh, their ASA is 100,000 or 110,000, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's night and day, yeah. So, but, so the left is making the move forward, and then the Global South on uh, Friday, release their statement to fill the void and their statement this communique has been parts of it were written months ago mm -hmm. and 
parts of it were sort of updated during this past week. The uh, drafting committee uh, was an Englishman and a Singapore bishop, Keith Sinclair and Ranesh Panaya, uh, put together this, uh, put the final touches on the statement released on Friday by Archbishop Tito Zavala and Justin Badiarama. They were the ones who led the press conference. And essentially they, they said, we will be in impaired communion with those bishops and dioceses that uh, reject Lambeth 110. And we need, essentially they reaffirmed uh, the traditional views on human sexuality. They say that, you know, they say to something that Henry Arambi, you know, said to you, I don't know if we mentioned this in the show or in the pre- <laughs> Yeah, we did. Show. We, we, we talked about it in the show, yeah. Uh, that, you know, we're not a Canterbury Cathedral. We're a, uh, a uh, drift. We are a church that is, a, finds its identity not in our relationship with the Archbishop of Canterbury, mm-hmm. but in relationship to prayer book and scripture and tradition and reason. There's no salvation and, through Canterbury. Yes. Ed, Ed, so, Ed Canterbury agrees. And the next, and so I, I encourage you to look at Phil Ashey's uh, essay on this point. Mm-hmm. And this is, it's remarkably good news because the, the difference between GAFCON and the Global South is that GAFCON has long been, has long been public about their breach with Justin Welby. The Global South hasn't wanted to take that step. In other words, if you're a, if you're a bishop, our, our lost boy bishop, his bishop is along the banks of the Nile and uh, it has been flooded and half of three quarters of his diocese is underwater. It's suffering from tribal warfare. It's suffering from depredations of Muslim, uh, the uh, jihadist terrorists. Uh, homosexuality is not a big deal. Uh, it, as an issue, mm-hmm. and any time Justin Welby will, or the Anglican Communion puts out a statement saying be nice to the Christians, or don't do this or that, it helps them. This is what the Humphrey Peter, the the Archbishop, the Bishop of uh, Peshawar in Pakistan says. You know, we need our links to the Western world where we are minorities or where we're oppressed. Uh, our lost boy bishop also said something very fascinating. He he was sharing one of the discussions they had he had with at his table group and there was an australian bishop and today fry uh saturday the the discussions were um uh i skipped friday friday was on discipleship where michael curry gave one of his uh love and jesus things without any substance it's all you know fizzle Uh, didn't he sing the john lennon song whatever okay yeah yeah go on (laughs) What's the say? All sizzle, no steak, sort of yeah. presentation. Yes, and you know it well. So, but people like to hear that, but mm-hmm. they don't have the Michael Curry secret decoder ring, which means that he's just sort of a poor man's. Uh, uh, well, I, I won't hold on. It, in fairness, Michael Curry is a dynamic speaker. He can bring the audience to his attention, but he does not deliver the gospel. He delivers the Beatles. He delivers. I want to hold your hand, and so yes. I, as far as speakership, we could use more people who have Michael Curry's ability to command a room. We you could just use need a, to give him a better script. Better script. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Okay. I want to be fair here. So Friday was discipleship. Today was sort of taking communion forward, and at two, and at two thirty our time will be the final press conference. Justin Welby speaks one more time uh, tomorrow. He's had three major. Uh, he'll have three major talks, which he essentially says nothing that he hasn't said before. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in their table groups this morning, uh, our lost boy bishop uh, was talking to. What's what are the challenges facing you? today and the uh and the the south you know the lost boy bishop says you know hunger uh 
dysentery because the Nile's flooded and we don't have drinking water and and uh, having enough clergy and having enough Bibles and having enough uh, catechists to teach the gospel because the people are so hungry to learn and it's, you know, we can't get enough of the resources to share the faith um, because people are just waiting open hearts open minds open hands to the hearing the news of jesus christ and he talked to an australian bishop who said i'll probably be the last bishop of my diocese because secularism is so strong in my diocese that there's no way to justify financially or practically having a diocese and will be merged into our neighboring diocese because the christians are becoming secularists and uh Bishop Zechariah said he was dumbfounded. He couldn't understand, he couldn't comprehend yeah. how the good news of Jesus Christ didn't set people on fire. It didn't, uh, didn't change worlds. And this, I think, is something that to me is so telling. Uh, Justin Welby wants to manage decline. He wants to avoid using his authority and office to make decisions. The hard left, or the left, wants to make a decision, which is normalizing gay relations, and what's next? Uh, pedophilia? We just don't know. Well, um, it's just, and if anything, of the last 15 years, we have proved the slippery slope theory. We have gone from uh, allowing for gay unions, civil unions here in America, to same-sex marriages to now having kindergartners uh, attend drag queen shows putting dollars in the panties of drag queens all that in 15 years wow uh, <laughs> and and so the global south is essentially i don't want to call it a volcano because and i don't want to imply that uh, they don't know what they're thinking but see culturally uh, and this is my subjective opinion based on my experience in reading mm -hmm. in English culture the noble loser the spirit of Dunkirk the spirit of he played a good game even though he lost is admired and Justin Welby was displaying that the graceful loser who did his best who played a straight bat and all that stuff other parts of the world that's despised mm. uh, the loser uh, whether he's graceful or not uh, doesn't say that and in African culture y you do not criticize the chief you in public you do not share with outsiders one of the hard things for us as journalists is getting negative news out of the African churches one of the hardest stories we ever did was the adultery story of Stanley and Tagali because very difficult, yeah. nobody wanted to say anything negative about their former archbishop because you were letting down the side. Now Justin Welby coming into Lambeth and through Lambeth and up to this moment is still on side for the Global South. But there but for them culturally, Justin Welby's continual mea culpas for colonialism and for the English oppression of other people and for stealing the uh, cultures and of the people around the world you know one bishop said to me that uh, you know they brought us the gospel why are they apologizing for it um, we're what we're I think are going to see coming out of this lib is a period of the global south coming closer I see Gathcon and lamb and the global south coming closer together. Now, they'll still be apart because of personalities at the very top. Mm -hmm. um, but each of them have a specific function. If you will, GAFCON could be the advance in the Global South, the more ecclesial group. Institutional. and Institutional. At, at this point, all they have is each other. There's nobody from Lambeth and the Archbishop of Canterbury, and, and we both agree on this, you, you and I agree, and Justin agrees, he will do not defend the ancient faith. So where does the GAFCON and where does the Global South go, George? Well, they go into each other's arms. One mm -hmm. of the things that the Global South said is that we're no longer 
a geographically bound group. We're no longer the global south. We're open to anybody yeah. who uh, upholds the doctrines of the Christian faith and the and worships in the Anglican tradition. There's uh, no reason why I cannot, if they decide to open it to parishes or dioceses or individuals as a fellowship or a, a there's no reason why my little parish in Florida uh, couldn't be a member of the Global South. Absolutely. No, we are in the South of the United States, but that doesn't count. <laughs> the, the, oh, well. Jill Duff's, you know, the more I think about what Jill Duff wrote, I, I don't mean to be dismissive, because I do think there was a movement of the Holy Spirit. I don't think she's identified it properly, though. What I think the movement of the Holy Spirit was, was the blinders have come off for many in the Global South. Uh, there was an incident uh, earlier in the week where uh, one of the, Archb the Archbishop of Canterbury's senior staffers, and I won't go into too much detail uh, as to who and what, took aside an English bishop and basically tore him from limb to limb he was disloyal. He was undermining the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was letting down the team. And the Global South was never going to come together because too many of them relied on money from us. And they weren't going to cut off their noses despite their faces, which is an American expression to mean that they weren't going to cut off the flow of financial support for schools and training and flood relief just to sign on to of the doctrines of the Christian faith as promulgated by the Global South. Mm -hmm. uh, same time, Paul Eddy, who is an English priest in the Diocese of Oxford who ran the Global South's sort of ground game, has you know, been vilified behind the scenes, behind closed doors um, by the other English. Um, man deserves a medal for what he did with so little resources. Um, uh, and you know, even I have been uh, sat on, have, have have attempted to be sat on from on high. Mm -hmm. uh, see, for Lambeth Palace, Gafcon is a real enemy, and their part of their focus was to accuse the Global South people of being secret Gafconites, uh, which is like a little weird. It but, is weird. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I think I think I think all of the members of GAFCON are members of the Global South, uh, <laughs> but the point being that they're seeking to divide and conquer. They're seeking to, uh, and that really isn't going to work anymore. And I I agree because here we saw the Global South uh, through the Archbishop of South Sudan do a magnificent job of presenting their side and not backing down. Not mm -hmm. kowtowing to Lambeth or the Church of England or the West in any way, shape, or form, and honestly trying to understand what the West was saying. Yet we, we do want to listen to you. We, we take at heart all of Lambeth 110, where we listen to the stories, where we try to minister and to, to be sure that we understand the full context uh, of Lambeth 110, not just the, the, the gross parts. And in as such, I was very proud to watch the Global South here without GAFCON support do a good job in defending, raising the issues, and able to walk out on Sunday after the service with their heads held high, knowing that they were the defenders of the Orthodox uh, Gospel. Um, I have, uh, oddly enough, I've come under personal attack mm -hmm. a, in the uh, Church Times. The Church Times not attacking me, but the Church Times repeating what uh, Lambeth Source is telling them, yeah. of uh, breaching confidentiality by revealing the contents of the private discussions. That's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Church Times, for actually giving me in the journalist world a really great compliment. So I, not no problems with the Church Times. Paul what Handley's did, a great guy. What did but, George Orwell say uh, about journalism? I'm trying to remember the quote. If um, you're not offending somebody, you're just doing public relations. That's it. Yeah, something like that. And I'm like, you know. 
Well, let's let's take it let's take it back to stuff we didn't know before our our last show. Mm -hmm. um, the negotiations between Welby and the Global South primates, um, which are just well, they met finally met on a Saturday night and they laid out what they wanted. And we summarized what that was in the last show. Correctly, uh, precisely. Separate wor correctly, separate yeah. worship facilities, mm -hmm. uh, a list of the people, a uh, rec record of voting, and a, state, a letter from the Archbishop of Canterbury. And Justin Welby uh, hemmed and hauled and said he'd give him in, um, I'm sorry, not, they didn't want a letter from Justin Welby, excuse He offered me. it, yes. They wanted an up and, up and down vote on Lambeth mm -hmm. 110 mm -hmm. at, and five minutes to speak at the Tuesday at the plenary. Welby in its place offered a letter. And the draft was given to them on Sunday morning and they turned it down. And the negotiations broke down at that point. So the Global South, and in the past, the Global South would knuckle under. They'd just take what they were given. Absolutely. And so Welby gave them nothing. I don't think they have a separate prayer room on Sunday for tomorrow, for tomorrow anymore. Uh, they certainly don't have a list of people who's here, who are here. We don't know. We don't have, you know, he, every day was a different day of voting at Lambeth. Uh, electronically, by voice vote, by hands, by remaining seated, by remaining standing. Uh, it's just nonsensical. And the uh, Welby released his draft letter which the Global South primates released, uh, rejected as being legalistic and not asking what they wanted. And essentially being so very, you know, validity has a meaning in canon law. Your marriage is valid. The service is valid. It's licit, meaning it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, what does that mean in connection to letter from ten minutes valid? It it doesn't. It, in other words, it takes a lawyer to de to decode what, what he's saying, and the, what the global south was wanted. We want something from you, Justin Welby, not from your lawyers. Mm -hmm. Well, Welby wouldn't back down because Welby's key desire was unity, and so Welby released his letter which essentially was the draft that he was going to put through. I haven't seen the original, but that's my understanding. And then the Global South did what they wanted to do. They went and have are going an ongoing uh, call for signatures to uphold Lambeth 110. Mm -hmm. And this will basically give us a clear uh, field for who is and who is not in communion with one another because the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans will not be, will have impaired communion with uh, those who are basically outing themselves by signing on to the Michael Curry statement. Now, I suspect that the GAFCON head office is going to get a lot of phone calls this week by people uh, wanting to go to a reassuring conference in Kigali uh, after the disappointment they feel here at Lambeth. You mm -hmm. know, for all intents and purposes, the de demonic veil that's been covering uh, the Church of England and the Anglican Communion has been revealed. Okay, that's the, the work of the Holy Spirit that's been talked about. And, you know, now we know exactly where Canterbury stays. Uh, we know exactly where the Church of England is and the West. There's no more lies anymore. Nobody's, you know, having and hawing about where they are on LGTB rights within the church. Um, you're, you're getting uh, where a generation passed Frank Griswold, where a generation passed Rowan Williams, everybody's mostly telling the truth about where they are on this. I, I, not sure about the Kigali conference. Mm -hmm. I, because you need to be sign on to the Jerusalem Declaration to be there. And I think they also either I think the Global South and GAFCON need to hold a joint conference. I agree. Yep, absolutely. At this point, the GAFCON back office 
is not able to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't have the, you know, GAFCON hasn't had a press officer since Andrew Gross uh, okay. was pulled back and is now the ACNA press officer. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have, uh, Ben Kwashi has been battling cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have the money that they had uh, from the, you know, in past times. Uh, uh, this is my this is my statement and I apologize well, if I this is, but hold on. This, this is why people honest, watch our show we're honest about the good and the bad and the ugly when Sydney ran the show mm-hmm. for ill better for ill and they made one or two mistakes mm-hmm. things were done it was organized it was great Sydney's not running the show since Peter Jensen retired mm-hmm. and we need either Sydney to take it back or we need that. We need a, the second and third and fourth tiers of GAFCON to step up. To step up, and I think we need serious efforts to raise the money to hold a joint conference with the Global South, one that can be jointly held with the Global South. So, if somebody who says I won't go to a GAFCON conference, they can go to this as a Global South. If they don't want to go to a Global South conference because I'm GAFCON, they can go to that. Or if you are an Episcopal bishop. Who, if you go, if you sign on to either, you get a target on your back, um, and you're in the next Bill Love. You need something to, and have this as a conference that I think doesn't have ten different plenaries. So you, Lambeth, you know, you, the bishops had, in essence, forty-five minutes to discuss an issue amongst themselves, and then move to the next topic for the next day, and then hear speeches. In tables of seven, it was in tables of seven, you know, ridiculous. Yep. Yeah. And so, in other words, if they had cut down to two or three topics, mm-hmm. um, it would have been so much more effective, and you would have had so much better communication. So the whole get, getting back to a much maligned word in Dava. Now, of course, this has been given a uh, Anglican twist, but in Dava is where you basically gather together and talk it out till you come to a conclusion. It's not you gather together to talk, so you don't come to conclusion. Anglican indaba is the opposite of traditional African indaba, which is everybody sort of talks till they reach its consensus. We need that sort of indaba from the Global South, from GAFCON, on one or two key issues. So in other words, if we try to crowd women's orders and uh, uh, sexual ethics into one meeting, it's you know plus mosquito the environment plus global hunger plus 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 it's not going to happen so if if i were advising gafcon i would say reach out to the global south in a meaningful way in uh in a way of and work together to find a way keep keep kigali a gafcon meeting because GAFCON needs to be clear what it is and what it's doing and how it's going forward. GAFCON has a purpose. But find a way to have a, a, a joint type meeting, find a way to raise the money, and have this as an effective council, if you will, of the church rather than a pep rally or, you know, a. Uh, this is like the Lambeth, one, the Lambeth 2022 has basically been a management seminar. It's interesting. It's exciting. It's you know, you get to dress up and wear funny hats and, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's not been. It has accidentally been cathartic and accidentally seen the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but I mean, is this perfect. is this the Lambeth that Justin worked for? It, is, oh no, definitely not. No, and so uh, is the, this the Lambeth Justin deserved? Yes because he never was going to give the global south what they wanted yeah but now he has now he's neutered himself but he has he also led the anglican communion it's certainly the church of england and certainly the head of the the sea of canterbury are charging down in extinction right now okay yes and he he has given ammunition to the left and to the right Mm mm-hmm uh, to, to remove him from office uh, was put out by Sam Margrave, a member from General Sin- of General Synod, unless uh, he allow the 10 vote. And we'll see how that plays out. 
The left is still furious over what they consider the uh, sw uh, bait and switch over having reaffirmation of Lambeth 110 mm -hmm. in there. And bef at the last Senate, the, they've increased the number of overseas Anglican voters in the well be retires in four years. And instead of having one overseas Anglican among the nomination commission, they're going to have five. Well, that now makes no sense because the Archbishop of Canterbury is now no longer what he once was. He is not a, he is not a, he's a, he's a, a figurehead, not an actual leader. So who cares who the figurehead is? Yeah. What the, the, so, you know, the, the left who are fearful that, you know, the five people on the committee are going to be Peter Akinola and uh, Foley Beach and all this and that, no, yeah, that's not going to happen. But yeah. there's no purpose now to have the foreigners on the committee. Munir Anis, the uh, former primate of Alexandria, uh, Bishop of Egypt, has long said we need for the primates to exercise the responsibility for the communion as a whole as peers, and that includes electing the first among equals. In, in other words, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Let the English pick an Archbishop of Canterbury, but let the head of the Anglican communion Mm -hmm. be selected from amongst the primates themselves. Right. And two heads. You know, Anglican Ar or Archbishop of the Communion, Archbishop of Canterbury, two different people, absolutely. Yeah. And the now the English will push back by saying, well, we pay for all this Archbishop of Canterbury stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, somebody, we need to find the money to allow uh, Let's let's just say let's say uh, the Archbishop of Uganda mm -hmm. is elected the head or the peer. The Church of Uganda doesn't have the money to fly him or to to spend a quarter or half of his time on international business and flying him around these places and giving him a back office and this and that to do the added responsibilities. Well, we need to find a way to either endow the office or. Um, find a way that these churches can contribute more than they're doing now. Now, in a difficult down market, that's hard, but there's money in the United States. There's Absolutely. money in Canada. Sure. There's even money in Nigeria and mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Oil money, could, yeah. <laughs> there's money that could mm -hmm. come up with uh, 10 to $20 million okay. to put into a trust that funds the operations. All right, so um, we, need to, we need to switch here. We're, we're at 52 minutes, and we promised the Indian corruption story. So well, take a deep money, breath. Money, <laughs> money, <laughs> money, we're trying money, money, money. Uh -huh. Money so, makes the world go around. The so world go around. Let's talk quickly about the riots in India over a corrupt bishop, uh, and then we got to close out the, the session here. Well, our uh, continued reporting on Dharmaraj Rasalam is uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, we reported that uh, he, the police raided his home, raided the diocese on uh, suspicion of corruption, uh, selling admissions to a diocesan college, selling church properties and pocketing the proceeds. Uh, he was interviewed by the police for 10 hours, forbidden to leave the country so he didn't go to Lambeth. Took his passport. And took his passport. And on this past Sunday, uh, about a thousand members of his diocese marched to his home through the streets of his the city in South Carolina. I can't pronounce the name without it being in front of me. And chanting, and uh, there, I posted a little YouTube, uh, a Facebook video that somebody had taken of the march, of the Indians marching with their hands raised, chanting, all this and that. Quite exciting. Well, as they approached the and with the priests of the diocese leading and giving speeches every so often, standing on boxes and uh, well, they got to his house and a police line had formed and the police told them to disperse because they didn't have a permit. And it's like watching Dr. Zhivago or well, something yeah. where, where the Cossacks <laughs> mow down the peasants. Uh, they wouldn't disperse. And so the police wearing helmets with batons charged the crowd, beating them with batons, uh, screams and yells, uh, 60 people arrested, a uh, few taken to hospital with uh, bashed in heads, all to get this bishop to resign.
Oh, my goodness. If we had only done that for Charles Benison, what would they have done at the Philadelphia Police Department? Oh, goodness. <sighs> well, we got to clean up and have a good story at the end. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And if you have $10 million uh, to make the world go round, uh, don't uh, send it to Anglican no, Inc. No, actually do. Go to anglican.inc forward slash donate and put the $10 million in our account. We will disperse it on your behalf. And, George, oh, oh, I am George Conger. <laughs> and today, episode 750 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm-hmm.